Good morning once again and welcome back. For those of you joining us just now for the first time, welcome to In Defense of Christians, Capitol Hill Advocacy Day. For our second panel discussion this morning, discussing Turkey's persecution of Christians, my name is Richard Gazelle, Executive Director at IDC. Once again, our team will be monitoring your questions throughout the discussion, so I encourage you to submit your questions in the YouTube Live comments section. As many of you know, in December of 2019, both houses of Congress passed a resolution recognizing the Armenian Christian genocide which took place between 1915 and 1923, per perpetrated by the Ottoman Turks. It took the lives of 1.5 million Armenians and over 1.9 million Greeks, Assyrians, Chaldeans, Syriacs, Aramaeans, and Maronites. In April of 2021, President Biden also recognized the Armenian genocide. But we must ask, how much has really changed in the last century? Any casual spectator of international affairs could easily recognize the concerning trends exhibited by the Turkish state, particularly under the Erdogan government since 2002. Turkey continues to persecute its final remaining Christians through overt acts of violence, and most notably, through increasingly weaponized Turkish legal system. But Turkey's persecution of Christians extends even far beyond its international borders. With us today, to discuss these alarming trends, we have Dr. Ikan Erdemir, Senior Director of the Turkey Program at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, Aram Hamparian, Executive Director of the Armenian National Committee of America, Dr. Amy Austin Holmes, joining us via Zoom, Public Policy Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, Dr. Michael Rubin, Senior Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, and Andy Zemanides, also joining us on Zoom, Executive Director of the Hellenic American Leadership Council. Welcome to you all. Thank you. Dr. Holmes, I'd like to uh, start with you. IDC has closely followed your work concerning Turkey's kinetic aggression and occupation in northern Syria, particularly its impact on the final remaining Syriac and Assyrian communities. What are some recent developments uh, and what is your outlook? I'd like to thank um, the In Defense of Christians for hosting this summit today and for inviting me to speak. Uh, I'm sorry that I couldn't be there to join you in person. Uh, I, I, I'm particularly uh, glad that we're actually joining together today to have this discussion because we are at a critical turning point uh, for the Christian minority in the Middle East, in particular in Syria. We have now uh, already in 2019, March of 2019, declared the victory over the territorial caliphate of ISIS. And although we won the war, we are at risk of losing the peace and losing essentially everything that we achieved since then um, if we do not address the myriad uh, sources of instability in the region. And this includes not only the ISIS sleeper cells that continue to uh, carry out attacks in northeast Syria and Iraq, um, as well as um, the instability caused by the Assad regime, Iranian-backed militias in Syria, but also the uh, very serious and ongoing instability caused by the numerous Turkish military interventions in northern Syria. Now, um, the Turkish government is essentially engaging in um, an Arabization policy or a Turkification policy that will if left unhindered, exceed in scale the Arabization policy of the Ba'athist regime uh, that happened decades ago. Um, now, this Arabization and Turkification policy is happening in the areas that Turkey occupies in northern Syria um, because Turkey is using primarily Syrian Arab militias that uh, many of whom espouse Islamist ideologies. So Turkey has essentially created a second military uh, in addition to its own military, a second army, which they're now calling a Syrian national army. Um, now, in the past, some of these groups uh, fought against the Assad regime uh, as part of different free Syrian army brigades. However, now the main purpose of the Syrian national army is not actually anymore to uh, fight against the Assad regime, but rather Turkey is using them as proxies. They claim to target uh, PKK or what they perceive as PKK in, in Syria, but in reality, what they are doing is trying to undermine the entire autonomous administration of North and East Syria, which governs approximately one third of Syria in the areas that have been liberated from the Islamic State. 
And in order to undermine the autonomous administration in northeast Syria, Turkey and their proxies in this so-called Syrian National Army are targeting not only Kurds, but anyone who has any kind of affiliation with the autonomous administration, including Armenians, Assyrians, Syriac Christians, Yazidis, uh, Arabs, uh, Syrian Turkmen. And so what, uh, what if, if we look at sort of their policies as a whole in terms of targeting the civilian infrastructure, the uh, power, uh, power plants, for example, that civilians rely on for electricity, weaponizing the water supply that Northeast Syria relies on to, for, for, for their water, uh, it becomes clear that this has, you know, actually nothing to do with um, an anti-limited, anti-PKK campaign, but it's really an attempt to undermine the entire region of Northeast Syria, where some uh, approximately 4 million people live. And, and so I think if we recognize the, the scale of what Erdogan is trying to do, it will be quite alarming um, because we, we realize that the you know, modicum of stability that's been achieved since the defeat of the Islamic State in 2019 is, is at risk. Um, and so the Turkish operations uh, are, are worrying for this entire region, but in particular for the religious minorities. Um, there are um, a, n a number of religious minorities, including Armenians, Assyrians, Syriac Christians, and Yazidis, who may not survive in their ancestral homelands. And I, you know, I'm not exaggerating, but they, they may not survive unless we address the root causes of this instability um, and make it possible for those uh, hundreds of thousands of people who fled from the interventions to be able to return to their, to their homes. Um, if we look at this also from a historical perspective, I think the longer term trends become clear. Um, Turkey has once before annexed a uh, province of Syria, the Hatay province, as it's now known, or Liwa Iskandaruna, as it was known in, in Syria back in 1939. Um, at the time, in 1939, French colonial officials actually justified allowing this annexation to take place because they claimed that this would uh, prevent further Turkish interventions in, in Syria. And so the, the interventions that happened now in 2018 in Afrin and then in 2019 in the area between Tel Abyad and Ras al-Ain, or Rish Aino as it's known in Arabic, or Sarikani in Kurdish, very similar dynamics played out because the proponents of those interventions or those who said that this would be somehow, um, that you know, appeasing Erdogan would allow Turkey to sort of have the stability they desire and allow them to have the so-called safe zone, as they were calling it, to protect their border. Uh, proponents believe that this would, uh, again, appease and, and calm down the situation. But instead, what we've seen is the opposite. We've seen an, an, a continuation of instability. And so Turkey has no, not achieved their own objectives, which they say they want in terms of protecting their border, achieving stability. Um, but we've seen an ongoing insurgency now in some of these areas and uh, the, the mass displacement of, of hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and so the um, now, because we're speaking again from a longer term historical perspective, I think it's important to mention that um, one of these cities that now Turkey occupies in the Turkish backed militias is Ras al Ain. Um, Ras al Ain or Rish Aino was at the time of the Armenian genocide um, in the um, in 1915 1916 the second deadliest site of the Armenian genocide inside Syria. An estimated 65,000 to 70,000 Armenians perished in Ras al Ain alone, um, and it's believed that actually one of the reasons that Ras al Ain was chosen as a site for these atrocities is precisely because it was relatively a relatively remote location, distant from the embassies or consulates in uh, Aleppo, for example, or, or Mosul or, or Damascus. And uh, tragically, what we're seeing again today is that um, because of the, I mean, at the time of, again, 1915, 1916, the um, but, you know, it was chosen as a site of this for these atrocities because it was a relatively remote location. There were few foreign observers in the area. Again, today we're we're witnessing um, uh, uh, Turkish attempts to pr 
prevent any outside observers from visiting these areas, uh, particularly now the most recent intervention between Tel Abiyad and, and Ras Al Ain. And so this is one reason why I think a congressional delegation would be important to visit these areas now occupied by Turkey and to uh, report on the, um, the situation there. But in part because of this lack of access, to the area. I have myself relied on data from the Armed Conflict Location and Event Data Set, ACLID, to create data sets to provide an objective assessment and understanding of the, the nature of the conflict along the Syrian-Turkish border. Um, and using ACLID, I went through thousands of cases of armed conflict recorded by ACLID because I took the Turkish you know, claim seriously that they were threatened by the SDF or YPG on their southern border. I mean, that was their justification for the intervention. Um, and so because I took this claim seriously, I took the trouble of going through thousands of events in ACLID. Um, and I found that from January 2017, which is the first date for which they had data available, until August of 2020, there were 3,319 attacks by Turkey or Turkish-backed proxies against the SDF, YPG, or civilians, compared to 22 cross-border attacks from the SDF or YPG inside Syria into Turkey. And 10 of those 22 incidents we could not independently verify happened, and the 12 that we could verify, in fact, did, that they did, in fact, happen, all took place um, after Turkey launched the intervention in October 2019. So they were in response to the intervention. So this ACLA data confirms internal assessments by the highest ranking US diplomat on the ground the entire time leading up to the intervention, Ambassador William Roebuck, who in an internal memo said that the Syrian side of the border was quiet for the year and a half leading up to the Turkish October 2019 intervention. And so to you know, sum up, this Turkish intervention in October 2019, after the phone call between Erdogan and former President Trump, was essentially based on a lie. And so I think it would be important for the Biden administration to, to recognize this and to recognize that following the Turkish narrative um, has gotten us nowhere. It's led to mass displacement of uh, civilians, including religious minorities, and that um, we need to instead rely on objective information in order to devise U.S. policy to the region. Um, and I'd just like to close by saying, you know, when we talk about these huge numbers of people that have been displaced from, from the border because of the Turkish interventions um, and the historical parallels from the time of the Armenian genocide, um, I think it's important to just remember that these are, you know, actual families. They're not just statistics or numbers um, or historical uh, you know memories of, of these tragic events but um, one Syriac Christian family who I spoke to recently fled in October 2019 but they one member of the family stayed behind trying to protect the property that the family owns in in Rish Ain or Ras Al Ain so they have a home in the city of Ras Al Ain and a farm uh, outside in the countryside and this one, this uncle of theirs who stayed behind to try to protect the property so that they could eventually reclaim it um, when it would be safe to return was, you know, he had to get permission from the Turkish backed militias to travel from their home in, in Ras Al Ain to uh, the countryside. So, you know, he had to get special permission from, from the militias. Um, and then one day, some of the militias came to him and said that uh, they wanted him to participate in essentially a propaganda video. So a propaganda video to show, look, there's a Christian who's still in Ras Al Ain and to make a video about it to try to convince the world that things weren't that bad in, in Ras Al Ain and there is in fact at least this one Christian who's still there. Um, and uh, he knew that he couldn't refuse. And so he said he would do it the following day. And then he escaped that night because he did not want to take part in this propaganda video um, to you know, try to whitewash the Turkish occupation of Ras Al Ain. And so he left. And um, now there's no one from the family uh, who's left there to protect the property. And the Turkish backed militias have, in fact, appropriated their property and enriched themselves um, from the homes that have been left empty by the uh, Christians and Yazidis and Kurds and Arabs who fled 
because they do not want to live under the Turkish-backed uh, militias in Ras al Ain. And so I think it would be very important for the United States to ensure that it is possible for everyone who fled from these areas to return, to regain their property, to receive compensation for the property that was stolen or damaged, uh, and that the U.S. actually needs to mediate this uh, conflict, um, similar to other conflicts that have been, uh, we found a peaceful resolution to, for example, between Egypt and Israel with the Camp David Accords, the no um, in Northern Ireland, the Good Friday Agreement, that this conflict requires a serious U.S. effort to mediate um, that's in the national security interests of the United States and the very survival of religious and ethnic minorities in Syria depends on it. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Holmes, for that. Uh, I'd like to shift now our attention to a good friend, Aram. Uh, it was one year ago, just about one year ago, uh, when Azerbaijan attacked Artsakh. Um, a native, um, centuries-old uh, Armenian homeland. And I think it's also proper to say Turkey uh, attacked via Azerbaijan. So Aram, since, uh, since that occurred one year ago, what has since unfolded, and how can the United States best respond via uh, policy? Okay. Uh, thank you, Rich. Thank you, Rich. Let me uh, take a small step back. And when I say a small step back, just about 100 years, which for Armenians is just a recent history. Um, to understand where we are today, Rich, and, and where we're heading, um, th I, this is how I think about it, right? About 100 years ago, when, when the Turkish Republic stood up, uh, it, it seems to me anyway that the, the, the West, the U.S., Europe, and, and, and Kemalist Turkey came to some general understanding, and the understanding was something like, listen, the past is the past, you know, we'll leave that behind, and what, what happens inside your borders, that's, that's your business but we expect you to be um, a reasonable regional partner, right? And that was like the basic deal. You know, help us on the regional stuff and we won't you know, remind you about the genocide you committed and we won't really say much about the people that, that you mistreat uh, inside your borders. And that deal st stuck for a really long time. And like, when was the pivot exactly? It might have been the 2003 Iraq war. It might have been this April when, when uh, Biden recognized the Armenian genocide or 2019. Pick your pivot, doesn't matter, but things have pivoted. And, and they pivoted under Erdogan, and he's basically taken uh, Turkey in a, a different direction. DC has been generally slow to, to, to catch up with that. So I think we're kind of in that environment where things have changed. Erdogan's perfectly happy with that. The US is not, is kind of of two minds. You've got a congressional mind, maybe an executive branch mind, some tensions and stuff. But it's pretty clear that the era of the blank check for Turkey, uh, that's by and large over, which is good for us, right? Which means that the that US, the United States is reclaiming policy, policy that was once outsourced to Ankara. So b before, like, if you want to know US policy on Cyprus, well, don't ask the US, ask Ankara, right? You want, same is true of the Kurds, same is true of the Armenian genocide. That era of they get to decide, they set the policy, they export it to DC, we enforce it for them, that's over. So that means uh, because the policy is being reclaimed, we enter the plane of politics. And that's good, because we live in the plane of politics. We're citizens, we get to vote, right? This is a place where we can make a difference. In that prior era, we were just you know, observers, you know, bitterly banging on the doors trying to, to, to make a difference, but now that we can make a difference. And the, the, the key to making that difference, right, is to, to, is to pick your fights, right? And I think the fights that have been, that have been chosen uh, uh, collectively in DC by some of the folks here, some of the folks uh, out there, have been the F-35s, the S-400s, uh, the, the CATSA sanctions, uh, the drones that were used, the drones that were used uh, against Armenians in, in Artsakh, right? Um, you you got to pick the battle. The Grey Wolves, the, the, the NDAA bill that's up before the, the House hopefully later today will decide whether or not the House sees the Grey Wolves as a terrorist organization. But I'll just stick to the, the drones, for example, right? Um, Turkey exported or deployed, sold, gave, whatever, uh, gifted uh, drones to Azerbaijan, very advanced which they used against Armenians in Artsakh. Um, turns out some were shot down. They opened them up, found at least 10 US parts. They found some Canadian parts. The Canadians uh, uh, blocked all export licenses, which is a good thing. The US hasn't done that yet. But Sec Under Secretary Newland was asked about it uh, during her hearing before the Foreign Relations <laughs> Committee. Uh, 28 US legislators wrote to Secretary Blinken about it. Uh, it is uh, the subject uh, also of an NDA amen amendment. I believe this is one other thing. Um, yeah, that's it, NDA, letter, Newland. Also, there's a, a letter that uh, 
IDC and the ANC joined with other groups in writing to SpaceX. I know that Dr. Rubin has written about this. Uh, you know, SpaceX, ask SpaceX, better question, ask the FAA, why are you launching Turkish satellites that will surely come back to bite us? So, uh, and these are battles that you win or you lose, but at the very least, the battles that can be fought. And I think that's kind of where we are today, which is we're vastly better off than we were five, 10, 20 years ago. Uh, we're uh, now, as I said, in, in, the, in, the, in the field of politics, which means you win some, you lose some. We're not, Turkey doesn't, because they don't get everything they want, doesn't mean they get none of what they want. And they have, they have good resources. I saw the, the very, very uh, kind uh, readout of yesterday's meeting between the, um, the foreign ministers meeting. And it was like, it was like a, you know, emphasize Turkey's important role as a NATO ally. So there's gonna be a little, little back and forth, but ultimately the arc of it, I think will we'll move in our direction. Um, so I think we're moving in the right direction, just gonna take uh, a lot of work. There are limits, I'm, I'm very much, uh, Andrew made a very good point about uh, the limits of folks in that part of the world waiting for uh, Western salvation. Uh, that's really, really good advice. Uh, uh, literally 100 years ago, uh, President Wilson sent, and I'll wrap up with this. A uh, hundred years ago, President Wilson sent a uh, commission to the region. It was uh, named after the leader of the commission named General Harbord. And, and he was asked, you know, sh what should be US, the U.S. engagement with the Christians of that part of the world, with the Armenians? And, and he, he wrote a report for the president in which, uh, by and large, he argued <laughs> against U.S. engagement. Um, made some good points for it, but ultimately argued against it, just saying it's a bridge too far you know, uh, supply lines, U.S. Uh, sustainable interest, all these various reasons. He's like, yeah, probably, we're probably not gonna do that. And that, what, what he wrote about a century ago, pretty much applies today. So I think we have to be very, very realistic about where we can make change, and that might be the NDAA, SpaceX, drones, CATSA, F F-35s, things like that. It's gonna be incremental. It's not gonna be a, a fundamental reorientation of policy. No one's, as much as they talk about it, I don't think, there's any expulsion of Na uh, Turkey from NATO anytime soon. So I think we can aspire toward a, a more reasonable, responsible relationship with Turkey. And I, I would just leave it at that. Thank you, Richard. Thank you so much, Ram. I'd like to shift over to Dr. Rubin. Uh, Dr. Rubin, we've, uh, we've for a long time followed your very prolific work writing on Turkey. So for that reason, I don't want to bound your, your talk uh, with, a, with, a, with a bound question. Um, so I just throw it over to you to uh, provide your geo geostrategic outlook on Turkey. When I look at Washington, and when it comes to issues relating to Turkey, and when it comes to issues relating to persecution against Christians, I see two main problems. Number one is, as Aram has stated, the very short sense of history which Washington has. And the second is the tendency within America's bureaucracy to stovepipe. First, let's talk about history. I didn't know it at the time, but I ended up being one of the last non-Armenian Americans to be able to go to Artsakh um, just short of a year ago. And I had no concept when I went that the surprise attack that was launched had coincided with the 100th anniversary of the Turkish invasion, the Ottoman invasion of the independent Republic of Armenia. Certainly this wasn't a coincidence. And understanding that certainly gave a much broader context, especially when we then subsequently heard both Recep Tayyip Erdogan and Ilham Aliyev's Islamist rhetoric with regard to uh, armies of Muhammad and so forth. And the only conclusion that could be drawn then is that the ideology of genocide didn't disappear with the end of the genocide which uh, the Biden administration formally recognized, only to then walk back literally the next day with regard to um, issuing once again the waiver of Section 907 it makes very clear that while in Turkey, and specifically with Recep Tayyip Erdogan, where there is a long arc of history, where there is a long understanding of this, that the United States' short-sightedness truly undermined our ability to analyze where the region was going and what is at stake. 
the concept, the, the short-term memory syndrome which the United States has also applies to international law. I had always been taught, including when I was in Artsakh itself, that the United States recognized not only the disputed districts, but also Nagorno-Karabakh itself as Azerbaijani. However, and, and certainly this is the case within the State Department, where people rotate for two years at a time and simply inherit the conventional wisdom which was left to them by their predecessor, and they have no idea where such conventional wisdom generates. However, if we look not 100 years ago, but just 30 years ago, to Azerbaijan's re-independence from the Soviet Union, we see Azerbaijan basing its independence and its claim to statehood and its legitimacy on the first republic of Azerbaijan rather than Azerbaijan's Soviet Socialist Republic, which means, according to Azerbaijan itself, Nagorno-Karabakh isn't necessarily Azerbaijani. There's no reason why the United States needs to blindly accept the gerrymandering that was put in place by Joseph Stalin. Although, to give the State Department benefit of the doubt, any of the 20-somethings or 30-somethings who are manning the desks have no, absolutely no idea that that is exactly what they're doing or about how Azerbaijan justified its own independence back in 1991. And so this is just an indication of the broad sweep of history. But Aram also talked rightly about the drones and the deadly impact which not only the Turkish drones but shamefully the Israeli drones had in Artsakh in the surprise attack that coincided with the anniversary of the Ottoman invasion of Armenia. The fact of the matter is, however, that Artsakh isn't alone. Consider Tigray right now, where uh, it appears that Recep Tayyip Erdogan is willing to provide drones to the Ethiopian government to pursue what very much appears to be a genocide or the preparation for genocide against Tigrayan Christians. At the very, I mean, Ethiopian diplomats might haughtily reject such a notion, but just a rule of thumb is if you don't allow aid to go someplace, and if you don't allow diplomats to go someplace, as Amy talked about when it came to uh, the location of the original Armenian genocide, some parts of the original Armenian genocide, and then ongoing Turkish operations, chances are you have something to hide. And that's certainly the case when it comes to Tigray. It's certainly the case when it comes to Abiy Ahmed, um, who will become the no Norwegian Nobel Committee's most embarrassing laureate in its history. I have no doubt. But beyond that, we have the issue of Turkish drones going elsewhere. I mean, a drone base which is being um, opened or has been opened in occupied Cyprus. And all of this suggests that there is a pattern here which can't be fully appreciated if we only look at one country, another country, and look at this through the pipelines. And I'm not accusing in defense of Christians of doing this. Certainly, um, Greeks, Armenians and their various organizations, Kurds, Jews, and so forth are working together and coordinating information in a way which is much more proactive, much more broad-minded than our own State Department and US government is doing, in which we have situations where what happens in Cyprus, what happens in Ethiopia, what happens in Artsakh are considered three very different issues with diplomats that seldom talk to each other. So let me just conclude by highlighting those issues, that it is essential that the United States and American diplomats grow to have a much broader sense of history. Ancient history did not start 10 years ago. That's recent history. Nor do, do any US administrations, no matter how reprehensible one finds the previous administration, ever start with a tabula rasa when it comes to policy. 
We need a much broader perspective. We need to educate ourselves much better. And that is one of the reasons why I'm so glad that I've become acquainted with the work of IDC, which whether it's in Lebanon, whether it's in Armenia, whether it's in Cyprus and so forth, is at the forefront of this truly important education mission. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rubin. I'd like to shift now to, uh, to Dr. Erdemir. Uh, very similar to Dr. Rubin, I don't want to bound your comments, uh, so the floor is yours. Uh, I would like to start by thanking IDC uh, for holding this panel and inviting me. And I would like to have a more forward-looking set of comments about what the latest trends are concerning the persecution of ethnic and religious minorities in Turkey and what can be done in terms of a policy response. First of all, uh, to set the trends, uh, let me begin by arguing that as of last year, we are in terra incognito. We are in a completely new playing field, although this is not the view from the State Department or from Washington. Uh, most observers take a look at Erdogan's decisions to convert Hagia Sophia and Cora and think that, okay, it's a, it's a symbolic conversion that mainly aims at uh, the domestic audiences and ultimately, you know, most within the EU and the US uh, chose to look the other way or chose to accept it. But ultimately, I think what people have missed is that those conversions and the language, the, the policy rhetoric that accompanied them uh, have fundamentally changed the nature of belonging, the nature, the nature of citizenship within Turkey. Uh, one framing that the Turkish government used to justify the conversions was the right of the sword. So they were making a reference to a 15th century uh, conquest and conversion law as justification of a you know, 22nd century policy within the secular Republic of Turkey. So that decision and rhetoric, I would argue, uh, have fundamentally changed the nature of the Turkish Republic, relegated Turkey's religious minorities from de jure equal but de facto unequal citizens to de jure and de facto subjugated slaves or subjects. Basically, they are now dominated subjects of a sectarian and unequal regime. Second, uh, with the, again, uh, by senior Turkish officials references to remnants of the sword, or the Byzantines among us. By the way, the first one is a pejorative term to refer to genocide survivors, and the latter is again a pejorative term to refer to when you think about Byzantines as not just being Greek Orthodox, but as kind of the pre-Ottoman non-Muslim heritage of Anatolia, of Asia Minor. That too, uh, I think fundamentally reframes the, 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 the belonging, uh, the legal and practical belonging of non-Muslims to the Turkish polity at hand. So that is, I think, a big deal. And Turkey watchers uh, should have made a bigger deal out of it. Now, the, the key trends based on this that I see as worrying trends are, we are transitioning to an era of captured communities. Uh, I characterize what came before as excluded communities, discriminated against communities, targeted communities, but captured communities, in my mind, represents a more advanced form of discrimination and subjugation. In that, these communities are now asked to be active agents in their own subjugation and accomplices in the whitewashing 
of the Erdogan regime's atrocities. And what I mean by that is the leadership, both religious and lay leadership of Turkey's non-Muslim communities are now expected to be willing and able players in whitewashing the regime's persecution and crimes. How, you might wonder. First of all, through spectacles of tolerance. And what I mean by that is they now have to attend ceremonies or sign statements or play um, props in various window dressing attempts to show that the Erdogan government is tolerant, benevolent, and embracing of minorities. And this could simply be a letter, and these are all real cases, a letter forced on Turkey's religious minorities where they state that there is no pressure on religious minorities in Turkey. Or this could be a letter for them to express their support of Turkish cross-border military operations in northern Syria. Or this could simply be an, a, a, a request to perform certain religious ceremonies at highly publicized spectacle events. Just to give you an example, when Turkey received flak for converting Hagia Sophia, Ankara demanded ecumenical patriarch Bartolomeo to attend in person at the height of the COVID pandemic, a, a ceremony, a, a liturgy at the Sumela Monastery. Because the Turkish government, after a five-year hiatus, wanted to reopen the monastery and hold liturgy one day a year to showcase its tolerant treatment of Christians and particularly the Greek leaders who are hostage and almost at you know, gunpoint, you know, symbolically, uh, after threats, to partake in such spectacles of tolerance. Here, the responsibility is on the Erdogan government. I think uh, both US and European audiences need to make it very clear to Ankara that they don't want these spectacles of tolerance. They will not partake in them, and they do not want to be willing participants in these photo op stunts. The second issue, again, a, a major new trend, is that religious minorities who vote with their feet, which basically means they disappear demographically from Turkey for good. You know, Turkey's Greek Orthodox are now less than 2,000, possibly closer to 1,500, almost all above 60 years of age. Turkey's Jewish community is now below 17,000. So minorities are going extinct in Turkey. They're voting with their feet, as some of my you know, non-Muslim Turkish colleagues here in the US tell me. They have left, not because they feared the government themselves personally, they could have endured the hardships, but they said for our children, so that they can have a future. But at the same time, the Turkish government makes sure that while the religious minority communities disappear, there is a flourishing of museums, churches and synagogues that do not serve as worship halls, as houses of worship, but as tourism spectacles, as museums that the government restores and manages, and then maybe one day a year allows religious ceremonies, but uses 365 days a year to showcase the government's tolerance and benevolence as talking points, as props, as window dressing attempts. So again, I think it's important that Turkey's Western counterparts do not partake in such whitewashing ceremonies at such sites and give legitimacy and credibility to the Erdogan government's stunts. Now, 
how about policy? And let me end with some policy suggestions. What is to be done? You know, because this campaign will only get more intense. And I'm not going into a third important trend, and that is extraterritorialization of Turkey's persecution. Because until recently, most of the problem had to do with minorities within Turkey. But now, through proxies, as well as cross-border operations, now religious minorities also feel the Erdogan government's wrath beyond Turkey's borders. And uh, my colleague Amy has done a great job talking about that. But let me go into the policy aspect. So what can be done uh, as we have these new strategies of persecution and domination of uh, ethnic and religious minorities? Uh, first of all, uh, I think there is really an important role uh, the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom and the State Department can play. You know, USERF has been recommending Turkey to be designated a second tier uh, country for years. Now it's called the special watch list country. This is the second tier after a CPC designation, a country of particular concern designation. Certainly with the conversion of Hagia Sophia, I think Turkey merits a CPC designation. So I think it is time for USERF to start recommending Turkey to be designated as a CPC country. But more importantly, I think the State Department needs to take the first step by not looking the other way when it comes to a special watch list designation. Because so far, the State Department, with the exception of a year, I think 2013 possibly, look the other way. I think this year should be the year when finally, and I don't have any hopes, especially given now how Erdogan has leveraged Afghanistan uh, to force the Biden administration as well as Brussels to appease Ankara. But nevertheless, I think the State Department should do the moral thing and follow USERF's designation. But beyond that, I think there should be a concerted transatlantic effort to demand Ankara, first and foremost, to grant legal status, legal persona to all religious communities in Turkey so that they can enter into legal transactions and own and utilize property. They can, as Turkey should stop interfering in the election of religious leaders of minority communities. We have seen such attempts with the Armenian uh, patriarch election. Uh, Turkey sh stop, should stop interfering in religious minorities' attempts to train their own clergy and, for example, open, reopen the Halki Seminary. And finally, the Erdogan government needs to end state-sponsored and sanctioned propagation of hate and conspiracies against religious minorities which make them victims of hate crimes and hate speech, and which make them even more reliant on the benevolence and the good graces of the Erdogan government for protection. And let me end my um, talk with a call to you all. It is really important to work with allies within Turkey and outside Turkey among the Turkish diaspora. And one thing you can start doing today is to show that you are in solidarity with Turkey's leading minority rights advocate and human rights advocate, Osman Kavala, who has been in solitary confinement in a maximum security prison for over three years for no other reason than to defend the rights and freedoms of every single ethnic and religious minority in Turkey for advocating for Turkish-Armenian, Turkish-Greek reconciliation, for documenting and restoring Turkey's religious minority heritage. And instead of getting a medal from the Turkish government, his life has been destroyed. This is a person who is Turkey's leading philanthropist who devoted his entire life, energy, and wealth to upholding Turkey's pluralistic 
heritage and future. So I think it's really important at a time when the State Department and the Biden administration have dropped the ball on Turkey and human rights, that we stand in solidarity with Osman Kavala and the like in and beyond Turkey. Thank you. Thank you so much, Icon. I'd like to shift finally over to our friend, Andy, who's joining us uh, virtually from Chicago. Andy, uh, as, uh, as we know, just by being spectators of, of Turkey, there's been a lot of activity as of recent in Cyprus. Just last month, Erdogan was in Cyprus grandstanding what essentially is tantamount to, um, to the Turkish annexation in northern Cyprus. Uh, shortly thereafter, last week or two, you were actually out there with a congressional delegation led by Senator Menendez uh, in Greece and in Cyprus particularly. Uh, Andy, what did you take away from that visit and what's next for the U.S. government uh, in your perspective? Sure, and thank you, first of all, thank you for, to the IDC for, for all its work, uh, not only today, but over years. And I want to start off like in the spirit of the approaching uh, baseball playoffs, my, my colleagues loaded the bases, so I have to knock in the, the runs. But uh, if there is one takeaway, I want to echo what, what Icon said. Uh, Osman Kabbalah, it, it, that, that should be, and he represents so much more. He, he represents everything Icon said, but also represents how bold and uh, Erdogan feels that he's never going to be held accountable, not for anything. Uh, Kavala's case is closely tied with Henri Barkey. Uh, if I if I, I could go on and you know, I could spend the whole panel talking about the threats that Icon and Michael uh, have gotten, uh, or even for for the you know given given our advocacy on the drones, uh, and Turkey's putting out paid former agents in the state, well, current agents, but former State Department officials like Matt Breiser to call I, to call Aram. Uh, a, an extremist. Uh, this is a regime that has physically assaulted Americans on American soil. Uh, so let's not forget that the end, and, and by the way, they, they, they conducted the farce of having a parliamentary delegation minus HDP, which are trying to ban, come and visit uh, the Congress. So let's remember who we're talking about, that it's not only interest, it, there's a value proposition here. Cyprus is a little bit of a microcosm of all the issues we, we, we're talking about. Um, go again to talk about Turkey, uh, Turkish activists, true Democrats, secularists, human rights, whatever, whatever anybody wants to, to label them. Think about that Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots minus Turkey left out of, out of the uh, out of the picture, if Erdogan was out of the picture, could probably reunite Cyprus. Uh, and Erdogan saw that as a threat and got involved in, and ICON has written about this extensively uh, and rigged the last election. So Akinci would lose and uh, you have a hardliner, Tatar, who wants to upend stability in, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, when it comes to uh, religious freedom, uh, religious freedom, and again, following up on the point uh, about the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, uh, they, starting back in 2012, in the Turkey chapter, were talking about uh, what Turkey is doing to churches and to Christian heritage and to Christian worship in occupied Cyprus. Uh, Turkey really raised a tremendous stink about the their occupation activities being put in the Turkey chapter in the USERF report. Uh, unfortunately, both USERF and State Department have stopped reporting on those activities in that report of late. Uh, but if you saw what they did with historic churches in Cyprus, and let's remember the first Christian mission was in Cyprus, uh, St. Paul and Barnabas. Lazarus is buried in Cyprus. You have Armenian churches, Maronite. This is not just a Greek Orthodox. Cyprus holds uh, 
a historic place in, in worldwide Christianity. But if you saw what they did to historic churches in Cyprus, turning some into stables and barns and discotheques, uh, you would not have been surprised at what they're trying to do with Hora and Hagia Sophia. Uh, so I, this, is, this is really a matter of ending Turkish impunity. And there are ways to do it. Using the CPC, country of particular concern uh, designation, is exactly right on. And let's let's go back to the Hagia Sophia example. Vice President Pence tweeted about it. Secretary Pompeo tweeted about it. Uh, then candidate Biden did a whole statement about it. And then everybody forgot about it, even though UNESCO is saying Turkey has not told us how they're how they're preserving the Christian heritage of Hagia Sophia. Uh, it, Erdogan has an unfortunate habit of dealing with crises by creating more crises. And we, we take our eye off the ball. And the State Department is taking off their eye off the ball. And despite the Biden administration, I think, starting strong, uh, I echo Icon's fear of an accommodationist streak coming up because of, uh, of Afghanistan. And this is an accommodation streak that we don't have to have. Alternatives have developed that weren't there when the, the people who are in the Biden administration were last in government. You have a, a spirit of cooperation in the Eastern Mediterranean that back in you know 2015, people were doubting its lasting power. But if you look at the trilateral between Greece, Cyprus, and Israel, if you look at the Eastern Mediterranean Gas Forum, which also includes Egypt and Jordan and France and Italy, if you look at the trilateral working with the Abraham Accord countries, uh, the cooperation between Greece, Cyprus, and Armenia, India uh, now uh, developing relationships in the region, there are alternatives to Turkey. And this is a way for the U.S. to signal, if Turkey doesn't turn west, this is not a. This is, I'm not making a call to abandon Turkey because we're going to abandon the very activists that Icon said that we should stick up for. But we have to empower them because letting letting Erdogan continue with impunity is warping Turkish politics to the point that the day after Erdogan may not be any better. We have to, there are people, apologists, some who serve on the National Security Council right now who say, well, don't abandon Turkey. You know, we have to play for the day after Erdogan. Yeah, but we have to make sure that the pro-Western forces, the forces of tolerance of a Turkey that's tolerant and open to all its citizens, uh, and it is not using the captive communities. That's so important because that, that capture, as Icon noted, does not extend. It is not limited to the borders of Turkey. We saw it this week in New York. We saw it this week in, in New York, where because he's part of a captive community, the Greek Orthodox Archbishop of America went to the opening of the new Turkish building in New York with Erdogan, with Çavuşoğlu, with the leader of the Dianet who opened or reconverted Hagia Sophia with the sword at his side, and with the Turkish Cypriot leader who's calling for two states and not recognizing Greek Cypriots or all the rest. So uh, we, we have to call them out when we have to have an absolute, uh, this is on Capitol Hill Day, I can leave you with one message. Congress really led the charge in changing and starting to change U.S. policy, but we should put the feet to the uh, congressional feet to the fire on. You know what? If they if another congressional uh, parliamentary delegation shows up with the HDP, we're not taking the meetings. We're going to talk about Osman Kavala. We have to make sure we have to have to make sure there are consequences for the Sheridan Circle attacks, uh, and that's just the beginning. Thank you so much for that, Andy. We appreciate that. Unfortunately, we've run to the end of our time. Uh, I scanned through some of the online questions that we've been receiving throughout the talk, and uh, it just so happens that all the questions have been, in fact, answered very nicely by our experts today, so that just speaks to their expertise that much more. Uh, I'd like to give our audience here live an opportunity, if they do have any questions. Um, I see uh, Isaac. Yes. Just one moment. The mic is coming to you. Thank you. 
Hi, uh, thank you all for your remarks. Isaac Woodward from the Philos Project. Uh, this question is about basically Armenia and Armenia's diaspora and their choice for kind of a champion in this new era that's, that's existing, the choice um, of Russia as the bulwark of Eastern Christendom versus the US. I think um, I and others I know were disappointed with the results uh, of the ceasefire last year what actually happened and the Russians being the brokers, um, questions about if they're actually going to hold Azerbaijan effectively to some of those points that they were set to, for example, um, actually returning the remains and prisoners of war from the conflict I don't think has been fully satisfied yet. So I wanted to see if you could speak to that relationship between Armenia, it's uh, looking maybe to the West, the US as uh, someone to protect its interests versus Russia and how that influences the Turkey situation. It's obviously a complex mess there. This sounds like a good one for Ron, but I just ask for brevity but completeness. Okay, um, yeah, Armenia's in a tough neighborhood and has had a tough history. Um, and as the, the word complementarity has been used sometimes to define Armenian foreign policy, where uh, Armenia tends to look sort of to different vectors for different things. So um, given the history, given the neighborhood, more for security to the north, um, maybe more political engagement with Europe, uh, uh, reform to the U.S. So it's like we try to, Armenians, I'm, I'm speaking as an Armenian-American, but Armenia as a republic seeks by and large to, to balance the various neighbors, to balance, balance the various interests in the world in as healthy way, as, a way as possible. I think the, the game in the caucuses is, 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 is uh, to survive, right? And Armenia right now uh, needs to survive. And to survive needs good relationships with the US, good relationships uh, with Europe, good relationships with, um, with, with Europe, and with as many neighbors as will have good relations with it. As it turns out, uh, our Turkish Nazi neighbors are not interested in that. But I think it's a, it's a balancing act, and one that Armenia has tried to do for centuries. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, defer to Dr. Rubin in just a second, but I, I teach um, I teach Sunday school, and that's one of the classes I teach is how Armenians have so often through history found themselves straddling different empires and, and different competing interests. And, uh, and, and one day, if, if you come visit me at, at Sunday school, I'll give you the, the longer version. Thanks. Uh, I'd like to give it to Michael for about one minute. Very, yeah. very quickly, as a non-Armenian and as someone who in the past has been critical um, of Armenia's foreign policy orientation, let me put it this way. It's unfair for the United States to criticize Armenian ties with Russia so long as the double embargo on Armenia exists. But more broadly, more broadly, the Armenian diaspora is large in Russia, in the United States, in Iran, and in the United Kingdom. So rather than look at this as a liability, Armenia is actually well situated, especially now that its elections are behind it, to really be the place, the diplomatic focal point not just for issues relating to the South Caucasus, but far beyond. And it's time, I would argue, that Armenians and Armenia start pitching itself in that way, as the diplomatic focal point that has the connections that no one else does. Thank you so much, Michael and, and Iran, both. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for questions. Um, I invite you all, I mean, our, our experts will be here hanging around, so we can definitely take part in conversation uh, after we're through. I'd like to thank our panelists for joining us today. A special thanks to our participants, you all here uh, in person, as well as the folks at home joining us virtually. And with that, that concludes the first portion of IDC Capitol Hill Advocacy Day.